Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. And today we have a very, very valuable video for you today as we're gonna be reviewing some of my biggest hands against my friend Dom, AK Run D Like Diva. And we're gonna be doing it with one of his head coaches to get some insight review. I'm um, looking at how both of us played the hands. So I'm pleased to be joined by George Froggett today. And uh, George is a head coach at BitB Cash, as well as being a high stakes poker pro himself, uh, playing consistently up to 10 or 10 K, so 50, 100 blinds. And uh, really good player, really good coach. Really excited to have George on here to give us some good insight today. George, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for the introduction, David. I'm really excited. It's um, always fun to look at these hands um, that you played, and especially uh, in this episode when they're against one of our students. All right, so before we start reviewing these hands, I know people in poker always want the receipts. So we're going to look through some of the people that BitB Cash currently have in their coaching group, um, being coached, including by George here with us. So just looking through some of these posts on Twitter here with some of their students, um, you guys can see on their BitB Cash uh, handle here on Twitter, just going through some of the results. We have plus 132K, plus 117K, plus 98, plus 63,000, plus 100,000 in six months, plus 125,000, plus 68,000, plus 300,000, plus 287,000. So you guys can see a lot of their students having a lot of success. If you're interested in reading these testimonials, you'll see on their Twitter page at BitBCash as well as their website. Um, they'll have the testimonials posted there as well. So it's, it shows the graphs, which I know people love to see. And then also we'll just kind of give a couple thoughts that they have um, on being with the group if you guys want some feedback from people that are currently being coached with BitB. All right, guys, so for the video today, we're gonna to be reviewing a few of the biggest pots that Dom and I have played against each other, some all-in pots here. Um, so what we're gonna do is I'm going to go ahead and play the handout from my perspective, getting some feedback from George. Um, George does not know the results yet. He doesn't know what Dom's hand is. He doesn't know if I win or lose the pots. Um, but then after the hand, we'll kind of just touch back real briefly on Dom's spot and see if there's anything George would have done differently. So George, you ready to jump on in? Yep, excited to, to find out what Dom did. All right, so first hand I got for you, George. I have aces. We're going to be playing this one. Cool. So good start. Good start here. Do we have Dom opening button? We three bets. Goes back over to Dom, get the call. Uh, get the 973 flop, so obviously have an over pair here. And I think kind of the first spot, obviously we're three betting pre, but as far as like these low boards here um, and we're constructing our range, are you just purely betting your over pairs here? Do you like having some checks with some over pairs? And if you check over pairs, which ones make the most sense on these types of boards? Yeah, so I think you're exactly right. The way uh, I try and think about any spot is just first of all, visualize like what's my betting range. So if it's uh, like king, jack, do flop, it's not very difficult because you just visualize C bet everything. Mm -hmm. um, but then the lower board's more tricky because you kind of know that C betting everything isn't gonna be a great strategy. So you have to think like which hands might wanna check, which hands might, might wanna bet. Um, I think like uh, this this board's obviously nine high, um, and it's very easy just to be like, oh, it's a low board. But the difference between like nine high and seven high is quite big, because when you free bet the small blind, you actually have some nine x, but you don't have any um, seven x. So you can think like if you check and and it's on Dom, he knows on seven high boards he can value bet really thin against you because you you just have lowest base king and not much seven x. Was when the board is nine high, at least when you check, you're going to have some jack nine, queen nine hands, which kind of makes sense to naturally check. Um, so that's a very long way of saying that with over pairs on nine high, you can play more aggressively than on lower boards because um, checking your over pairs doesn't become such an important part of your defense strategy. Um, so yeah, very long way of saying you can bet over pairs quite a lot when the board is nine high or 10 high. Um, if you're going to choose which ones to bet, you want to choose the ones which are uh, more vulnerable first, so checking more of aces than jacks. Um, and I think like with this combo of aces, checking is very reasonable. Um, betting also not not that bad, but because the board's not that bad for you, so you're going to be betting a lot. But yeah, I think it makes sense to check this one. Okay. And then as far as like you said, like this particular suit of aces here, is it important? Is there a huge difference between having the ace of diamonds here versus not having it blocking like the flush draw? Yeah, you basically just want to think like how much are you free rolling equity to your opponent? Uh, where like if you don't have the ace of diamonds, uh, you make it a bit more likely he could have like backdoor flush with ace of diamonds and, and like check back and realize some equity against your hand. But it doesn't really matter because if you check him and he's got ace of diamonds, he's probably going to bet anyway. Um, so you don't have that problem. And like, yeah, so, so I think it's one of these things which you can trick yourself into thinking it matters more than it does. But if you're trying to just have like a system where you like know you're going to check some ace combos, bet the others, it does make more sense to check this one than, than the other combos, in my opinion. 
Okay. But it's not just just not that important. But checking is fine. Okay. All right. So so far one for one. Haven't made a mistake yet here to look at. So I end up checking the aces here. Kind of a lot of what you said is my thoughts in game. If I'm going to be checking any combo, ace is the least vulnerable. Have the diamond. Um, so I end up checking here over to Dom. So in Dom's spot before he decides the bet here. Just in general, like say, so again, we're playing 500 NL here. He's playing against me, a 500 NL player, 200 NL player. Um, are you, when you get checked to on these types of boards, would you say it's fair to say population is not protecting their checking range here enough? So you can kind of attack these spots even more than say like theory would normally dictate, or would you still be playing pretty close to theory against this line here so far? Yeah, I think it depends a lot on how much you respect your opponent or, or, or your, your player, so to speak. But mm -hmm. humans in general are like not, very t tend to be too weak when they check. Mm -hmm. um, so you tend to be able to bow your bet thinner against them. And I think that's the important thing in your Dom's shoes. You're not just thinking, oh, I like, want to bluff him. You're thinking like, oh, this guy's way too ace king heavy, so I can bow your bet super, super thin against him um, for a small size. And when you bow your bet a lot of hands, you can bluff a lot of hands as well, so you get to bet a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, basically, in almost all the games I play, and especially uh, five and out this stake. If, if I was in Dom's shoes, I'd be thinking, "Oh yeah, good. It's a nice spot to go, a, a bit wider maybe than equilibrium." Um, expect some people to be a bit too weak when they check, possibly. All right. So we do face the bet from Dom here. So he goes about a third. Um, in my shoes here, for when I do check over pairs, my assumption is I want to just call. But are there maybe some over pairs that you would be check raising here? Yeah. So. Um, yeah. <laughs> Basically, if you check an overpair, you normally want to raise at this SPR, I think, mm -hmm. um, because your overpairs can play for like a lot of value right now. Like they're clearly all value once you get them in. Um, and there's like badish turns, which can come where they become somewhat bluff catcherish. Um, and if you think like your calling range, it, you have like hands which stop Dom from just bet bet shoving with seven six. You know, like mm -hmm. you can just call down with pocket eights or jack nine or something. Yeah. Um, so yeah, mostly check raise, but then this specific one is maybe the one that you can call. Like, I don't, I think it's fine to call aces, but like, if you had kings or queens, I would say just always check raise and, and get it in. Okay. Um, and are you? And, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. All I was going to say as well is that obviously Dom, very strong player, but also like, if you think about your average opponent, maybe they're stabbing a bit too strong here. Um, so you become even more incentivized to check raise with with like aces because if their range is too strong, you just want to make sure you like force them to put more money in with it. You know. Like gotcha. The only appeal of calling aces is to get bluffed, and if the guy's not bluffing you enough, then don't don't trap him. So basically, more or less, we don't want an action killing turn to come for them. Not that we're worried with aces; it's more of that we're worried they their range gets a bad hand if they're like not exactly. betting here enough. Okay. And then as yeah. far as so, could you even check raise as thin as tens here if you wanted to? So like any of the overpairs? Yeah, for sure. Okay. I, I would definitely. I would like well, if I if I check tens, which I never would do, I would definitely check raise it. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. All right. So. I do decide to go for the call here, setting the trap on at Dom. Uh, get the Jack Club's turn. So check the turn here in flow, um, and then see a bet here from Dom. It looks like about half pot. Um, as far as like ch deciding which boards to check jam the turn on with a hand like aces, I'm not sure if I should be viewing this as a good one or like a bad one to consider check jamming. Um, just because obviously there's going to be some bad river cards here for us. Um, it's a pretty wet board that like this is going to hit a decent amount of his button calling range versus three bet. Um, so I guess like as we've played this one here, once I just call the turn or call the flop with aces, are you considering a check jam on the turn here? Or are you just continuing to set the trap and hope for like a good run out and have a chance to blast off here? Yeah. So it's actually a very interesting point and, and one which we maybe have to go a bit into the depth to explain properly. Mm -hmm. um, I think that basically whenever you're thinking about like value, is if you jam is for value, right? Whenever mm -hmm. you're thinking about value raising, you have to think like, um, are there hands that, so, so like we have to think like, is he gonna keep putting money in with the hands that we call us, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. So if you, if you check call him and he's got like Jack X, you can assume he's probably gonna jam the river. So no point check raising against that range. Mm -hmm. But because the Jack turn is, is kind of a specific turn and, and because of his sizing, so he's half pot, which I think is good. I would maybe even go smaller he probably has like a lot of pocket tens, nine X still, right? In his range, uh, he has hands which aren't, aren't Jack X, which are probably gonna check back the river. Mm. Um, so basically what I'm saying is like in poker, when your opponent goes for a sizing, which kind of indicates that he's like betting to check back, which is definitely common on, 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 on your set, I would say. Yeah. Um, you wanna make sure you don't let them do that if that, if that follows. Cause like the, the value or the EV of, of calling with aces is getting bluffed on the river or him putting in money again with worse hands on the river. 
Um, and if they're not going to do that, or if their strategy indicates they're not going to do that, it becomes more like you want to value raise yourself. Um, that said, I think calling is fine, fine too. But in game, I would definitely raise here uh, because yeah, I think that people probably miss a few bluffs, which like makes calling worse, and that they're probably like just going to check back the river with hands that maybe should just keep value betting. Mm -hmm. uh, like I think tens can probably just bet that show, and people might get a bit scared. Um, and and final thing I'll add, obviously, this is kind of technical, but also the like from a more simplistic point of view, the jack turn is like a very important one. That when you're dom, you have to think, all right, jack very very good for me because uh david isn't gonna check call me on the flop with jack um because how can he like he's yeah. just, just can't um and i've stabbed the flop with like loads of king jack queen jack hands so it's like a time where like it's very good for me in general i want to keep putting loads of money in with my bluffs and and obviously have a big value range too all right sounds good so I do end up going for the call here, but it's good. To, see, I'm already learning a lot from this first hand. I'm already learning this could be a jam here because, like, instinctively, me, I'm like, I just have to keep calling inside of the trap. But this is great. Yeah, so. I, I think I think a simpler way to put it is if the turn was a deuce. So if it was nine seven three deuce, yeah, it's way more clear you want to call because if it's a deuce, all of the hands that value bet on a deuce are going to value bet again on the river, right? Yes. There's like no no second pair uh, the value bet. Whereas on a, on a jack, it's like much more like he's like betting to check back with like king nine kind of hands. Um, gotcha so it's more or less like if the board changes like the i mean this is maybe too simplistic but if the high card changes you're more likely to jam in this kind of spot as opposed to like you said like a low brick like a two yeah just because he plays he plays a less polarized strategy on a jack mm -hmm. uh than on a deuce he's like value and bluffs on a jack he's like uh like some kind of like semi-value but like some bluffs some some strong value and you want to track the semi-value part of his range and putting more money into the pot uh kind of that logic Okay. Yeah, pooling is is absolutely fine as well because uh, aces itself will never become a bluff catcher really like he will still jam worse hands than aces on on every single river yeah uh, whereas if you called with like ace jacks somehow i, I probably just much prefer it obviously it's hard to have it but if you had yeah. ace jack i'd much prefer to jam okay uh, as you. perfect all right so we make the call uh pretty decent river here for us so we river top set um so obviously just checking in flow hoping he unloads the clip and fortunately he does so as far as like a poker strategic, I don't have much questions for you here, George. It's just a call even, I know that. Um, but the yeah. real question is if you're playing against a friend that you love to slow roll, what is like the ideal amount of time to slow roll? How far into the tank are we going here on this one? <laughs> well, personally, I, I would not go deep because I've had a, a bad history of timing out with nuts. So I think last time when I checked my um, checked my database last year, I, I timed out with actual nuts uh, like four times oh, um, in the whole year in like big pot. So. Um, yeah, I personally wouldn't risk it too much. And also, the other very risky thing about this board, let's see if you can identify it, what's the risk of slow rolling on, on this board exactly with pocket aces? Well, if he rolls over the 10-8, I'm probably going to have to log off and um, probably not exactly. play for at least a week. So Yeah, slow rolling without the nuts is a very risky business, um, in my experience as well. Um, but yeah, go go like into time mag enough to give him hope and then, mm -hmm. and then um, swiftly take it away, I think is optimal. All right, so we do go for the slow roll call, and fortunately for us, he does have the bluff, not the actual nuts, and we get to stack <laughs> Dom. Always fun. I think the current slow roll scoreboard between me and Dom is like he slow rolled me like twelve times. I've gotten him two, so I've uh, I've got a lot of catching up to do. But at least we got this one. Yeah, I think. Um, and yeah, I think his hand is like very. Uh, I always play the same effectively. Uh, okay. Only question is river because the ace obviously like reduces uh, value for. Him as interesting player. I mean, very, very quick final point is I might consider leading the river as you as well. Mm -hmm. um, because thinking just like asymmetric amount of aces and our check call, check call range. But um, like, I don't know. I, I think like a very, very strong player can lead the river credibly. Mm -hmm. um, uh, not, not saying you're not a very strong player. Oh, I, not I would not be balanced. Good. I would not be balanced. You're good <laughs> if I was leading. Yeah, this is the problem with leading the river is like, yeah. for most people, it's just not credible that you um, have like any kind of balanced range. It's better just to check and flow. Yeah. Now, if you are if you were developing like a leading range here with, with SPR is about one to one, like what size are you using on these spots then? Just out of curiosity. Uh, you, you have to always think how much is your bat, like what, what is your leading range centered around and how much is it worth uh, yeah. for value? Um, I'm just trying to think what my, I think most of the time when I lead here, I've got like, and so the reason I'm leading on the river is because I'm thinking, right, I've checked board twice with like a lot of, a reasonable amount of ASEC still, I think. Mm -hmm. Maybe not when he half pots. Yeah, too fair, maybe not. When he half pots, maybe we just don't call Ace King on the turn enough to, to, to lead. I'm thinking if he went like one third, one third, mm -hmm. then we have Ace King. Um, so yeah, mostly, I would mostly be leading smaller, I think that's about what as well. And just, just the same, just kind of thinking, right, 
Ace like stops, he's not going to value Betfin anymore when we check to him. Mm -hmm. So onus is on us to put more money in with our value range because tracking it isn't very appealing when he won't put that money in himself. But it's like a niche spot. And in my opinion, when you start like thinking too much about leading, you're actually much more likely to make errors or play an unbalanced strategy than, than not. So in general, like, um, yeah, I would think it's just fine to check and flow. And probably when you half past the turn, even maybe correct because you probably followed your ace king on the turn anyway. Okay. Perfect. All right. We'll see. We're already getting more spots I wouldn't have even thought of on the river. So this is great, guys. So that completes the first one. Got a slow run, roll in on Dom. So currently I'm leading him one nothing, and we'll jump into the next hand. Yeah. And both players played that well as well. So we Perfect. can know. Um... Perfect. One for one. There we go. <laughs> yeah. All right. So jumping into the second hand here, we're going to have a queen, ten of clubs in the cutoff. Pretty simple open here for me. And see the three bet from Dom. Comes back to me. I'm assuming a pretty easy call here for us in position. No, yep, pretty sure it's pretty right. cool, but my preflop, preflop strategy is a big weakness of mine, so I wouldn't <laughs> be surprised to see some folds. All right, so here we go. We go for the call and get the king high flop here. So king four three rainbow. We do have the backdoor clubs. Uh, so we face a small size against Dom here. So these are kind of spots that I'm I'm always interested in how wide we're supposed to float. So yes, it's a three bet pot, but we're getting a very good price here. We're getting over four to one. We're in position. We have a few backdoors. Um, is this a hand that we can consider floating here or is the fact that we don't have an overcard to the king a big concern? Yeah, I think like, uh, so for Dom, obviously, like, it's very good strategy to range bet, made, made even better by the fact it's just difficult for you to call enough. Mm -hmm. um, I think in your spot, there's like uh, common mis mistakes in prioritization you can make because we're kind of used to playing like deep poker um, where we think queen turn very good because we can make absolute nuts. And it's like very visual to imagine making a flush here or straight you know mm -hmm. um whereas obviously there's not that much money left so when we make a flush or a straight we actually don't win that much more mm -hmm. um so once the spr gets lower like this what we prioritize more than having like miracle backdoors is just having like one card which can allow us to win the pot a reasonable amount of the time uh so like a hand like ace jack uh i mean obviously you would call that hand anyway but like it's just just don't overvalue these backdoor miracle hands versus having like a pocket pair which can, can hit a set and always win the pot or, or become like a good bluff on certain runouts or having um just an ace and a backdoor flush draw mm. um but that said i think your hand's kind of threshold-ish like you have like a hand which is reasonable to call reasonable to fold and when i believe a hand is that i'm not entirely sure actually that that is true but <laughs> i think i think we're kind of about the threshold when we're mm -hmm. the cut off here um and when we think it's close we look at our opponent and be like oh, is there any way we can like make more money or, or lose more money on later streets and then go that way Okay. Um, but I would mostly call, to be honest with you. Okay. In fact, I would, I would well, pretty much always call. Okay, perfect. So I do call. And then I think that's a good takeaway, though, because I think basically what we're saying here is, like, if we have jack 4-3, that's a way better board just because we at least have the overcard. And then, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then yeah. as far as the suits here with the queen 10, is it relevant that we have the same suit as the kings? Like, we're blocking him from having king-queen suited or king... I mean, I, I assume the 10s may be more valuable just because, like... We don't expect him to necessarily through that king 10 0 here, but he threw that king 10 suited. So, do we think the fact that we have the same suit as the high card matters that much, or are we getting like in too thin of like a margin to look at? I think, like, that, yeah, I think mostly what I'd say is when you start thinking this level of detail, you're just more likely to confuse yourself than like gain any EV. Um, because, yeah, time banks are short, you've got to think about relevant things. Um, mm. But if you, if you like force me into a corner to tell you, I would probably yeah. say it's better, better to have clubs because you make stronger flushes. Oh, okay. um, because king, king and clubs on lock, but I'm actually I'm actually not sure about that because the effect you mentioned is also a thing. Like maybe it's better to pop king queen, uh, king ten. Um, but yeah, if if we were very deep, I'd say it's definitely better to have clubs. And then once we're very shallow, it's definitely better to have the other ones. But um, gotcha. yeah, not not um, entirely sure. Uh, one final thing I want to mention as well is it's very important that this board is king three four because uh, super blank. Obviously, like we never three x and four x may as well just not be there. Yeah. Um, whereas like and, and and I've told you I think this hand is marginal. Whereas if it becomes like king six seven even, um, then like obviously we just have way more like auto defends. Like the EV of calling these marginal backdoors become has, has to become lower, even if we do have some kind of backdoor straight on that that one. Um, but yeah, just just important to not like assume that like king xx equals king xx uh, because like the really low invisible cards mean you call wider than when they're not invisible. Okay, yeah, that's a good takeaway, and that makes a lot of sense. Like you said, there's not gonna be tons of or like really any like four three x much being played in here, so. The seven six is obviously gonna be much more relevant. We're gonna have more calls, so then okay, that's a good takeaway. Yeah. So I'm higher up in our range on this board. Yeah. yeah. So we do make the call. Uh, pretty fun turn card here. So we turn the nine of clubs. So we turn the flush draw with the gut shots. 
Uh, we face another bet from Dom here. And so I think this is kind of like a pretty big decision point. And I'm interested on kind of what your thoughts are here. So if we call here, we're looking at potentially like $420 in the pots, little under 300 effective behinds. Um, so obviously I'm, I'm not playing on folding here, but like, are we thinking about jamming here? Do we like to call? Um, my initial instincts are generally like out of position. Like I know it's kind of hard to talk about this hand as if we're flipped, but like if I were facing a an option to check raise a turn out of position, I'm at a higher frequency going to do it than in position. Um, but is this hand, like, do we do any raising here really? Or are we just flatting and taking it to the river? Yeah. So I think you're exactly right with what you said, like about OOP versus in position. Um, but I think, yeah, like obviously much more inclined to play aggressively or a bit in position. Mm -hmm. But I think to kind of crystallize your decision, it's good to think about why, why that is. So mm -hmm. if I ask you, like, um, if you call the queen 10 here, right, um, instead, of, instead of jamming, mm -hmm. um, and he checks you on the blank river, what, what's, your, what's your plan? So that you call the turn, then he checks you on the blank river. Yeah, so I think it at least gives you the option to bluff. Um, naturally, my first instinct is like, oh, it's bad to block the backdoor flush, backdoor straight draws. But you at least like have the option to bluff, whereas like out of position, obviously you just check and you lose kind of thing. Exactly, yeah. And I would even go as far as to say I think that bluffing on the blank river wins a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, like I think like even against like the best player in the world, I think it wins a lot of money because you've 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 called two bets, you've called one third, you've called big. Mm -hmm. You simply don't have enough bluffs to like to to use really. So every bluff you do have wins a lot. Like even if it appears to be bad blockers like this, yeah, I think at least. Um, so like. Uh, so yeah, like if we if we call, we have um, option one hit our draw, obviously win a lot of money. Yeah. Um, option two, bluff on a blank, which I think wins a lot of money. Option three, fold to a bet on a blank, which I think obviously is fine. Mm -hmm. um, and if we jam, uh, obviously we still win the same amount we hit our draw, but all the hands we fold, or a decent portion of the hands that he folds to our jam, would have check folded the river anyway if that makes sense so it's just less yeah. efficient because you you lose more to the hands that you're behind than you need to because if you have pocket aces and the river's a five it's probably gonna jam and you would just fold yeah um, whereas if you jam now you lose to him so yeah it's just it's just when you're in position this is this is basically why you play more passively because you have this option to like like uh realize your equity better you can uh win the money against his air whereas if you check uh, he's going to check for that ace five of cops on the river right as the OP player. Yeah. Whereas if you're if the positions are flipped, you just you just you just lose to those times when they check back. So okay. yeah. Uh, basic conclusion is when you have combo draws in position, don't jam the turn. In my opinion, just call. Cool, yeah. Uh, because you you have the strategic option. All right. Perfect. So good explanation there. Like I said, I think this is a spot I struggle with quite a bit, both with like the value. So like obviously my value hands be like looking at some sets in here as well, but obviously it's pretty thin if I don't have fours and threes, you know, it's whatever if you do or not here, but nines we could have, not gonna have kings. So I end up going for the jam this time and we do see the call. So eight on the river, not looking too good. And he shows up with aces. So kind of like you talked about there, like the exactly this kind of hand where it's like, if we call, he's going to jam. I would have to imagine pretty high frequency on the river. So if we hit, we get paid. But if we don't get there, we don't lose. So yeah, kind of what we you're lose like about a lot, there. a bit more. We lose a bit more money to like queen jack of nothing, right? Because it backs mm -hmm. the turn, jams the blank river, and we would have got to fold. But it's so a few combos compared to the ace king pocket aces. Yeah. Um, and 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 the final thing I'll say just about the turn because you said you jam sets. Yeah. I think like in position like jamming is just not that important really because you if you have a set, it's the same story. Like you have this option of like call the turn, always call the river, and it's fine. Yeah. Because you beat, beat value no matter what it is. Um, or when he checks you, you jam. So like by jamming you, you also don't achieve much. And the only hands I would actually look to jam in position are like marginal value, which free all a bit of equity. So like king queen maybe. I mean in this spot I might just jam nothing, but like ace yeah. king or king queen, where it's like if you cool, you let him realize like his queen ten of clubs. Um, mm -hmm. but never nuts. Like when you're in position at low at, at low SP, I just call the nuts. Mm -hmm. Um because you just get to win anyway against the hands that um you would have but any hand that bet calls the time is probably going to shove the river, basically, when you yeah. have pocket fours. So, yeah. All right, it's perfect. So, unfortunately, I got the first hand from Dom, but he wins the second one versus us. Um, I'd say pretty simple just to say, looking at Dom's hand, like, pretty standard. Just going bet, bet, and call off when somebody jams the queen high flush draw until him on the turn here. Yeah, I think he's played his hand well, but yeah. without without too much difficulty. Yeah, pretty easy yeah. one there for him. So, unfortunately, I couldn't get there on the river, but uh, we lose a stack to Dom. All right, jumping into our third hand here today. We got Ace Four suited, open from Dom in the hijack. We're playing pretty deep here, so we're about 180 blinds effective. So again, this is a two-five game. 
Uh, we go for the three bets and do see a call from Dom here. So going to the flop, queen five three. Um, I'm pretty sure I'm just ranging third here. Is that okay, or is that go? Should we have some checks here still? Yeah, I'm not sure on pre flop as well. Uh, this uh, like if it was 100 big points deep, I wouldn't three bet ace four suited. Yeah. Uh, deeper maybe it's okay to to mix in, but whatever, it's, it can't be that bad. Okay. Um, and yeah, the queen three five. The, the one thing that happens when you become deeper is um, your over pairs are worth less, right? Like mm -hmm. if you get an over pairs 100 big points deep on this board, you're very happy. Um, and this is the part of the range that you have and he doesn't have aces and kings. Mm -hmm. um, so generally, you're forced to play a bit more passive because your value rate, you, you can't play for value with many hands. Like 100 big points deep, you can just bet that shove ace queen, not worry about it. 180, it's becoming more dicey. And if you, if you can't play value, then you have to bluff less. So you get to play less aggressively. Mm -hmm. um, and queen five three at this step, I would start to think is like a bit a bit dicey to range bet, yeah. And, mm -hmm. and as always, like maybe you can say like, what, what do you think makes range betting better? Like what 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 can your opponent do to make range betting better or worse mm -hmm. for you as the as the OB player? Oh, you're saying in my spot, like why am I looking at range betting? Yeah, so like <laughs> so like if 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 you imagine like what characteristics could Dom have which might make you like want to range bet more? Uh, I would just, um, so my first instinct is a lot of times with these like kind of like drier boards, at least I'm kind of viewing as drier. So we have like a high card and two low cards is I generally am just like betting third quite a bit. Um, and then just like, so kind of what you said back to like, I have the aces, the kings, even the set of queens in range. Um, this deep, I'd have to imagine there's a good chance he can have sets of fives and threes, um, which, you know, kind of then now I'm almost talking myself into like why we maybe don't want to, because I'm not going to have fives or threes, three betting pre, um, but uh, yeah, I, I think I, my natural instinct is kind of range bet these boards where it's like one high card and two low cards. Um, but again, I'm not really giving great reasons to why here. I'm just saying that's kind of like how I'm normally playing the strategy. Yeah, and, and also the other thing is like, imagine you're like a thousand big points deep, mm -hmm. um, just to make it like really extreme and really obvious. Like then if like a flush comes on the turn, like you're in big trouble because you like can't put much money in with anything because you just run into a flush too often. Mm -hmm. um, and like this, this starts to, you start to understand the difference between a hundred and deeper is like it's just that you can't value you can't play your value range as aggressively because you just run into better hands too often. Whereas if you're like forty big ones deep, you just don't care if a flush comes, you'll just keep shoveling your entire stack in. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think basically also like generally people are going to fold a bit too much to see bets, play a bit too passively. And it's going to make you like make just like aimlessly betting a lot better uh, mm -hmm. than it should be anyway. And your exact hand is just like. It's just good to see that, right? You get ace jack yeah. to fold. You've got like backdoor null equity, which is good deeper. So uh, definitely can't hate see betting. But if you see that here with like eight nine of diamonds, I would be like mm, probably just losing money. Like there's no real way you can uh, justify it. Gotcha. So just hold off a little bit on those nine eight and ten nine suits here. Um, yeah. Now, as far as like a size here, are you still going for third, or do you like sizing up a little bit more than that? Basically, it just depends. Because like uh, the reason we bet one third is because. We're sizing up our value range, which mm -hmm. supposedly includes pocket jacks and pocket tens, so it's like not not big hands. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're betting like small traps and that. Whereas if we change our strategy to not range bet and just bet more, like like check our tens and jacks, check our queen jack, makes sense to size bigger. Um, so yeah, depends what you view your strategy as. If you think you're betting really wide, it's better to bet small. Uh, but personally, I would be like, oh, I don't think I can bet everything here unless I'm against a very weak player. So I'll choose to bet bigger and bet like uh, seventy bucks. Um, and um, use like this hand still fine, but go more on aces, king, ace, queen for my value range. Okay, gotcha. So I end up going for the small size, which based on the strategy I'm using of basically range betting, this is probably okay for the size. But like you said, we can basically more or less how you're constructing your range is going to determine like which size you want to use in these kind of spots then. Exactly, yeah. Specifically okay. which value hands you want to bet. Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right, so we do go for the bet here. See the call. Uh, king on the turn is interesting. So just in general, in these three bet pots, I both kind of want to talk from like a hundred big blind perspective versus like the closer to 200 that we're at here. Um, on the king turn, so in the exact situation we're in, I'm my gut instinct is we want to go bigger here, being a bit deeper. But I know, at least I should say, I think that sometimes if we were playing this hand like a hundred big blinds deep, we could be using some small like going for third again. So I guess like as far as how deep we are here, does it dictate which size you're using here on the turn on say like a turn to over card here like the king? Yeah, so it comes back to the same question as the flop, right? So on the flop, I said if you think you want to bet like your range, so really wide, uh, then you use small sizing because some of your value range, pocket jacks and pocket tens, is like 
not 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 worth big bets. You don't want to polarize around it. You're just kind of betting to realize your equity. Yeah. Um, and then when an overcard comes, we think the same question. We're like, all right, are we just betting a polar range? Like, are we only betting with hands that want to play for all in or a very big bet on the river? Um, and if that is the case, then we want to bet big. Um, but maybe we're like, oh, like this turn, this turn. This, maybe we're like, our oh, Dom never has a king here. He literally never has a king. So I want to keep betting queen x for value. In which case you would use a smaller sizing because you're like, oh, some of my range is very good. Some of it wants to play like two small bets. Um, so I use, use a small sizing. So the question I basically have, have for you here is like, do you think Dom has uh, king, a lot of King X in his range here? So, um, yeah, I would think, so like the obvious ones we could call here, I would say are Ace King, I wouldn't be shocked to see him do some more flatting pre-flop hijack versus small blind, just because we're deeper as like higher frequency four bet if say we're like a hundred blinds deep. So I definitely think like Ace Kings in range there, especially once I bet like third on the flop, I think it's reasonable. Um, obviously like a King Queen suited can make some sense. Um, King Jack, I guess because the club isn't blocked, he could have like a King Jack of clubs, King Jack of spades here. So I do think he has like a decent amount of King X here. Um, but I would still say like, yep. you know, kind of going back to pre-flop too, like we still have like the nut advantage of having like the two top sets here, whereas he maybe has an advantage on like the bottom sets, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I think what you said is very important, basically that like, Ace King off is an important one. Like these offsuit combos like really hinder your strategy. Like you can't value bet, in my opinion. You can't value bet ace queen twice here for, for like really realistic sizings and mm -hmm. be happy about it because you just run into ace king, which is so many combos, mm -hmm. um, as well as the other ones you talked about. So what I would do here is just go for like polarize around my very good hands. So use bigger sizing and think like my plan is to bet good hands and bluffs and check the middle of my range. Mm -hmm. um, whereas maybe if the board was like, um, trying to think of a better example, like maybe if the board was like um, 10, 8, uh, 10, 10 7 3 on the flop mm -hmm. and then jack on the turn i mean queen on the turn let's say 10 7 3 queen mm -hmm. um then i would be like uh, maybe i want to like use half pot here because i don't really believe the imposition player ever has a queen enough to stop me betting pocket jacks um so like in that scenario we're betting second pair so we bet smaller in this scenario we're not gonna we're just gonna be polarized so we just stick to our normal big sizing um okay so basically the king yeah, I think, and that's a good takeaway, though. So, like, it's, we can't just think of, like, all over card turns are equal, right? So, like, because the, he's going to have more king than, say, queen x on the type of board you talked about, the king is going to be a lot lower frequency of a bet because we don't want to bet, like, those good queens. Therefore, we're using, like, the bigger size because both, like, our bluffing and our value range is thinner than, say, on, like, the queen high turn. Exactly, yeah. And, like, our, our jacks and tens obviously want to check here. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you would never consider betting. Yeah. So, like, it's really different to, like, yeah, if your board was like 10, 7, 3, king, where like 10, 7, 3, king, like you can probably still get Jackson 10s, for, sorry, Jackson Queens for value. Mm -hmm. um, so you choose like a much less polarized strategy and bet way more often, whereas here we're just forced to, to play polarized. So yeah. Okay, perfect. And then as far as like looking at my hand here, so like obviously we still have the gut shot. Um, do we like continue barreling with this one? And then also my first instinct is specifically spades is maybe bad because we want to block some of those like backdoor floats. I don't know how much the backdoor float changes though, because a lot of times it's gonna be King X of spades. So is having a four specifically of spades a bad thing? And then would you like consider barreling this hand here? Yeah, so we just we just basically said our value range isn't that big, so we're like pocket aces, uh ace king plus. So like can't not that many combos. Yeah. So we have to be a bit careful of our bluffs. Um and we've have a million gut shots here to have ace jack, ace ten, jack ten. Mm -hmm. Um but I just also do like playing aggressive on the king, you know, like all humans have a bit of fear of ace king in their mind, you know, mm -hmm. they're like, it's so easy to visualize. So like, I, I, I would guess that like your hand's supposed to be an equilibrium check because like you said, spades bad yeah. and we have a million gut shots. Four very good though. Like four is just a good card to have, it means mm -hmm. that he's more like to have jacks and tens, which will fold. Mm -hmm. um, so like, yeah, I'd be like, think it's marginal, but probably in practice just bet because try and hope he's scared of ace king. Although mm -hmm. obviously Dom, stronger player, less likely to be scared, but yeah. still. Every human's got it in their mind. Yeah, still could like be there. Yeah, all humans scared of sharks, all humans scared of Ace King, just something you can't get rid of. It's like evolution. <laughs> yeah. But. Now, is like, and the fact that we have an Ace relevant to just because like we block one of the four that he could have, or is it just because if he has like Ace, or is Ace not super relevant because there's going to be, because he has like, if he has like all the Ace King off combos, like there's just still tons and tons of those combos there. Yeah, I, I would I would avoid like, in free bet pots, I kind of try and avoid thinking about blocking value too much because okay. just like can get confused. Like you said, it's like 
difficult to figure out if it's good or bad, but I think more about is there a way for me to win the hand? So ace is relevant because if we hit ace, we win pretty mm -hmm. often at least. Yeah. Um, and that's the main thing I think about it. Okay, perfect. All right, so do decide to go for the bet here. It looks like about three quarters and see the call from Dom. Um, eight of spades on the end here. So um, getting to this point here, we don't have much. So if we are trying to think about going for this one, um, I guess like the first question I'm going to have as far as like your sizes here. So we're looking at 451 in the middle, 659 back. I would just, I'm my my gut instinct is we we'll probably want to play as a jammer check here because again, kind of talking about like the hands we're repping, we're repping super thin. Um, or do you also mix in like would you have like multiple sizes here where you would maybe go small? Yeah. So so uh, yeah, like you said, you said hands are repping, and this is a really important thing. We first of all think what does our value range want to do, and we always. Like think like we're gonna bluff in the same season as our value range, mm. um, and this I'm very unsure of. To be honest with you, my instinct is that if you shove Ace King, it's not gonna end well for you. Um, mm. I feel like that's the case. Mm. Uh, One point five XSPR. I could be bet too nitty though, but my instinct at least would be to be like Ace King one size, then Aces and better hands another size. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm mostly not jamming because like if I have a set, I don't I'm not sure I take bet bet jam that often. Um, mm. So yeah, I would mostly think I'm I'm betting seventy five percent pot. Could be too nitty. Maybe someone in the comments can can um, run it and let me know. But yeah, I'd mostly think I'm like repping Ace King, which is about seventy five percent pot of this SPR. And um, I would always bluff your hand. Okay. Uh, yeah, no clubs, no um, no high cards. High cards bad here, I think. Yeah. All right, gotcha. So unfortunately, or I did go for this one. For some reason, I thought I didn't go for it. All right, so we do pull the trigger for three quarters here. I mistakenly do exactly what you are saying you would do here in this spot. Um, so we end up betting here, and then we actually see the call from Dom, lose to Ace King. Um, I feel like if we're looking at this hand from Dom's perspective, pretty standard. So kind of we've talked about Ace King a lot in this hand just because it is a really uh, relevant part of his range. Pre flop, a lot less four betting, hijack for a small blind, super deep. And then also floating flop, particularly when he has the ace of clubs, I'd imagine makes it even better. And then the turn, no reason to raise. And same for the river. Like, he's just not getting worse to call here. So I just keep on calling down here and hope I'm bluffing. Yeah. I, I, the only spot on the hand I would consider was him is raising the uh, river because I'd be like, maybe, like, I could be thinking, like, maybe David just jams when he has a better hand than ace king. So, like, it's mm -hmm. kind of a free roll. Like, maybe I'll get miraculously called by, like, king, king, jack of clubs or something. Yeah. Um, but I think probably better cool the um only thing i would note is like you can imagine a lot of guys in your shoes as the op player when mm -hmm. they have ace four end up jamming because it's just easy to think like all in mm -hmm. um and then when you have ace king end up 75 ing so this is just an example of a mistake players can make where like they forget their value range when they're bluffing and, and then they end up like with one size which is much more bluffs and one size which is much more value but um yeah i, I would I, i'm very unsure actually about this hand like uh whether uh, but I would play it the same as you, so sure. Gotcha. Yeah, and I think that's an interesting takeaway, kind of too. They talked about through the hand that can be applied anywhere is like thinking about your value range first, how you want to play those, and then basically creating your bluffing range using that exact same thought. So that way, like, kind of like you said, making sure we're using the right sizings. We're not just using one size with the value, one size with the bluffs, but thinking through these spots of like, okay, what does my value range want to bet here? And then if we bluff, basically using that same size, and then that also kind of helps us figure out like how many combos like you know roughly what we're looking at to make sure we're staying balanced from there yeah exactly yeah um and then river is like is it is it that appealing to bluff here i mean i think so mm -hmm. 75 percent pot um you need to get 37 percent folds or something i believe should mm -hmm. know by now 40 maybe 42 percent folds and you should and you should do i think yeah it's scary to cool down here yeah queen all right so it wraps up that hand all right, so jumping into our fourth hand here, we have ace queen on the button. We're gonna go for the open here and see the three bet from Dom in position. Uh, for me, at least, I'm doing a lot of flatting here. Are you pretty pure on the flat, or are you using a four bet here some as well? I like to flat ace queen. Yeah, I, I know you're supposed to four bet it sometimes, but in, I, I prefer to four bet it when I um when I don't like to call as much. But yeah, against the when button versus blinds, I just call it. Okay, ready? Yeah, All right, all right, perfect. So we're gonna go for the flat here. On the same page so far. Uh, pretty good flop here. Ace six two. And we're going to face the small bet from Dom. I'm assuming we just call in position. Kind of talking about a hand earlier, like in position, we're doing a lot less raising, say, than out of position here. Um, so even though ace-queen, like, again, I'm feeling pretty confident ace-queen, we're going to be way up versus, like, a big blind three bet, particularly from a strong player. 
Um, but are we on the same page in the sense that we want to just be calling here? Yeah, the, the, these swaps are interesting because you can't really range bet as Dom here unless you're like, so So in theory, if you're playing a very strong player, range betting is not great on these flops. Mm -hmm. um, however, the player pool tends to fold enough that you just can get away with it. Mm -hmm. um, but you want to make sure when you're the burden, you're not the guy who folds too much, right? So like, you yeah. want to be make sure like you're fighting enough to make a range bet strategy bad, which just means doing some study because otherwise you will fold too much. Yeah. Um, and then also it's, it's reasonable to construct a raising range against range betters because um, the way you can think about it is if you start raising on like nine, seven deuce rainbow, uh, obviously the hands you're gonna raise with value are like ace, nine, pocket jacks. Mm -hmm. And this is like more important to cool down with. Whereas on this board, if you raise ace queen, you can still cool down with like ace, ace five, right? You have loads and loads of ace x to bluff catch with. Yeah. So you don't like fuck, you don't like uh, hurt yourself too much by having a raising range. Um, oh. So yeah, I don't mind having a raising range. That said, you have to know yourself, might know if you'll find the bluffs, the, the pocket fives, you know, the four or five suited. Um, so calling only also fine. And obviously with ace queen, uh, you're fine to raise or call, but. Okay, um, perfect. Yeah, I think that's a good point that you make too. Cause like kind of going in my shoes here, like if I'm being honest about myself, I don't think I'm probably finding the bluffs here enough, which then it sounds like makes me lean more towards I should just be calling here because I'm not bluffing enough kind of thing. In a way, yeah, because you've got to think like, is, is it more, is it high? All you're thinking in poker is like, you want to take the highest CV option. You're like, is it going to go better for you to raise or call here? And if Dom thinks you're like on the, on the near side of your raises, obviously you don't want to have uh, a hand which could bluff catch properly in your raising range. So yeah, yeah. in like a kind of vacuum. I, if, I, if I was on your account, I'd probably call. Okay, perfect. Um, All right, so I do go for the call here. Uh, turn seven of hearts and see a, another bet from Dom. So kind of getting in, you know, one theory thing here we're having here is a lot of turn spots where I'm talking about, do we raise or not? Um, so as far as like on the seven turn here, so relatively a brick here does bring in some straight draws, but uh, the spades don't come in. No backdoor flush draw comes in. Um, is, if we take the option of flatting the flop, do we continue just flatting here or do you start considering raising? My gut instinct based on what we talked about earlier is we probably just want to call at this point. Yeah, the problem is your hand is a bit different, right? So that's something we're talking about sets, mm -hmm. right? And if you call a set, you always have a plus EV call on the river, right? Because mm -hmm. that's, so you're never ending up bluff catching. Whereas the hands that you actually want to consider jamming with are this kind of hand class where it's like marginal. It's like you can jam profitably. If you call, there's certain rivers where like you end up being like a bit uncomfortable calling again. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in, in three of the lowest PRs, your jamming range is always around this kind of hand. Like if I had Ace King here, I'd probably just jam it in. Um, and then my bluffs would be like some kind of pair and flush draw hand, six five, like something which like does okay against the calling range or just, or just pair uh, with mm -hmm. low cards, seven, uh, I think. Um, but also I, I do also think if you had no, no raising range at all, it would be fine here. So mm -hmm. that's fine. But I, I think basically if you jammed pocket sevens here, I think it was really not good. And if you jammed ace queen, I'd be like, sure, why not? Gotcha. Um, yeah, and that's an interesting point too because it's an interesting takeaway because like a lot of times you would think like, oh, the stronger hand we want to jam, but realistically, like you said, we still have, there's not going to be any river that we're worried about if we have pocket sevens or pocket sixes here, whereas like there sometimes can be some rivers like, let's say like the jack of spades peels off or the ten of spades peels off. Yeah. Or, you know, we start feeling a lot worse about our hand with like a hand like ace queen with one pair. Yeah, it's just a difference in SPRs. Like, when there's lots of money left, you want to put loads of money in with good hands. And when there's not much money left, like good hands can easily get the money in any way. So mm -hmm. you care more about like... Uh, like realizing equity with marginal hands um, mm -hmm. and like making sure you don't end up bluff catching with hands that could value, but um, gotcha. this kind of idea. Now here on um, the turn, oh, sorry, go ahead. All I was gonna mention here yeah, is talking about Dom's range on the turn here. Like uh, uh, what kind of hands do you think he should be uh, bluffing with, quote unquote? Yeah, so I would think the spades are reasonable. So like basically the spades that he has, I would say a hand like if he has nine, eight suited, 10, nine suited, um, I would be guessing is the most of what he wants to use. I'm not sure if maybe he should be using a hand like, even if he had like, let's say he just has queen high and it's like queen jack, even if it's not the spades because he's gonna be blocking some of my best continues. So like, if he thinks I'm four betting ace king, like closer to peer here, or at least at a high frequency, um, he wants to block a hand like an ace queen or ace jack that's gonna be like some of my stronger hands here. Yeah, but, I think basically what you said is a very good summary. Like, uh, I think almost always just draws because his value range isn't that bad and it's best to use draws. And then like the very best blockers, so queen jack, I think is reasonable. Okay. Um, the only thing I would add is that big blind free bet quite scary because people don't like to free bet mixed combos. Mm. And um, 
people just like to shovel money with ace king ace queen so in general i'm a bit scared of this line from population not so much from dawn but from population i think like uh the player pool might like shovel a lot with their good hands and then forget to bluff with queen jack like you mentioned so mm-hmm. um uh, like a bit scared obviously not scared of ace queen but uh, a bit scared yeah. Just yeah. with your range in general, like some of the weaker ace sucks that we could have here. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just perfect. still calling it all, but not happily about calling it all. Yeah. All right, perfect. So we do go for the call here. And going to the river, 459 in the middle, 352 back. See the five of diamonds. So one of the straight draws does come in. We see the spades miss. Uh, see the jam from Dom here. So I think the reason I wanted to talk about this hand, I think it's an interesting one, is like obviously we have one, our, one of our better aces here, but there's going to be a lot of times we get to these spots on the river where if like we're flatting the button with like most of our suited ace X, we're going to have some ace 10, some ace 9, some ace 8 suited, ace 4 suited. Um, so, you know, kind of talking about like, especially when the spades miss here, but 8 9 comes in, like, should we be looking to call most of our ace X here? Um, and then kind of trying to determine like how thin we think Dom probably would go as far as like his one pair of hands. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a relevant spot because, and it's a spot people often like feel uncomfortable in, I think, as, as you, um, because obviously yeah, A-side flops are the most common flops. Um, you also have a lot of top pair on there and you feel like you're block catching with your top pair, which is mm-hmm. quite rare because normally a free red box top pair, just cool down, don't think about it. Yeah. Um, the problem is we talked about his turn range, right? Do you think he's going to keep, do you, well, maybe not Dom, but do you think people in general will bluff you on the river with their spades that they bet the turn with? Uh, like if someone has like queen jack of spades, do you think he jams the river as a bluff? Uh, my assumption, at least like in the game, so again, like for those of you who are maybe watching for the first time, I play mainly like 500 and 200. I would say probably not. I would say, especially at least in the games I'm playing in, it seems like you see tons of give ups with like all the spade draws here in particular. Yeah, and then, and then if people give up their spades, then their bluff range becomes quite limited, right? Because... Um, they still have ace king, which forgive me if I'm wrong, but I think is eight combos when we have an ace, mm-hmm. and then ace queen, which is another eight, so that's sixteen combos, and then obviously the nuts probably add up to a few more. So like maybe they have like twenty combos of value or something, mm-hmm. um, and I believe that means they should have something like thirteen combos of bluffs. I could be completely wrong, but street mapping it, <laughs> and and like if they never jump a flush draw, like they're just never going to get to thirteen combos, right? Because their whole turn range is flush draws and 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 strong hands so i think it is correct to be like a bit scared in this spot um as an aggregate um but then we can flip it around and look from your point of view like so if we imagine if we change it around and like assume dom is bluffing enough Mm -hmm. so now assume he is a good player and we're like all right that means we have to defend uh like uh 60 ish percent of our range and we can think all right we always fold when we have flush draws uh so 60 percent of our range is definitely going to include some asex Mm -hmm. like because most of our time range is asex so we have to think, like, we maybe get to fold some, but which ones are better to call? Which ones are worse to call? Uh, what do you think? Like, which ASX would you rather call with here? Um, as far as, like, what my kicker is, you're saying? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, I mean, I think it's... The thing that I struggle with here is, like, how thin is he going for value? So, like, let's say, hypothetically, he if he wasn't going with it with ace-jack, and, like, say we purely had a bluff catcher, I would imagine, like, the first thing is you'd almost, in a weird way, with ace-queen, rather have ace-eight or ace-nine blocking the straights. My gut instinct is like Ace Jack can still go for this in his spot, but I'm not sure. So like I think that would be the first thing is like if he's going with an Ace Jack or not makes a huge difference. Like if he's going for Ace Jack, obviously Ace Queen becomes infinitely better than like Ace Eight Ace Nine. Um, but <sighs> kind of going back to the thing of like I have top pair good kick, like my you know one of my best kickers here. I would imagine this one's supposed to be a call down. I would want to call more with like the ace eight, ace nine. And then I think where I'd kind of get more in trouble is if I have like an ace 10 or an ace jack, which feels like clearly a bluff catcher at this point. Yeah, I think you summarized it well. Like, I don't think he can jam ace jack properly over here, but he can jam ace queen. Okay. So like, ace queen is like the fact he jams ace queen makes ace queen a call because you chop sometimes. Yeah. Um, so I would never consider folding ace queen. And then I would be like, yeah, like rest of my ace X, I know some of it's probably indifferent, like supposed to fold at equilibrium. Um, and I know that like, if he's going to be bluffing me, it's going to be with queen jack, right? So mm-hmm. I would start to think like jack 10, queen jack of the bluffs I'm looking for. So ace 10, ace jack, worse to call because they're bluff cutters with bad side guards. Mm-hmm. Um, and then call the rest of them. I think at equilibrium, you're not really supposed to fold an ace very often here at all. Mm-hmm. So like always call like the bad ones and always call the low ones and then sometimes call ace jack, ace 10. But given what we said, we think people are probably going to struggle to bluff enough because they like to just shovel with their good hands and they forget to bluff. Yeah. With spades. Um, so we want to fold a bit more, maybe. So maybe fold ace, jack, ace, 10. Um, 
thinking they're the worst ones. But yeah, I think the important thing here is don't sweat it when you have ace queen. Just just pay the man off and see what happens. Yeah. And um, same story if you have like ace four. Just just accept that like you can call ace four and still fold a lot too much. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense, you can still like be like you're still folding effective. quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah, you can still fold more than like the equilibrium scenario and call ace four happily. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, and like then with ace jack ace ten, you can think like if you think it's a we could play a fold more. See that's and that's a very interesting takeaway. And I think I know something I struggled with for a very long time is like, like I remember one of my first instincts when I you know I would talk through hands of people. It's like for example, what you're saying here is like maybe you fold ace ten, but you call ace four, and I'm like, why would you do that when ace ten's a better hand? But like you said, it's more about like the relevancy of like blocking the hands that he's bluffing, for example. So yeah, that's, you know, yeah. He, and he's also, not, yeah, it's hard to call ace four. Like you're still going to lose most of the time when you call ace four. I, mm. I think at least like because you you've got good pot odds, right? Um, yeah. So like. This is the hardest thing about poker. Like, it's hard enough to call in like very small pots, expecting to lose most of the time. But once it gets to big pots, like the pot odds are still the same. If you bet thirty-five into forty-five, it's like the same as betting three five, three fifty into four fifty. Yeah. It's just so much harder to be happy calling and losing when it's bigger. But for like a very strong poker player, this is what they're very good at. They're like good at like overcoming the the fear, the money, the money fear, so to speak. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. poker is a game of calling and losing and bluffing and losing. This is like. What, what the whole game's about really mm -hmm. um and like the more numb you become to it the better you become at poker but yeah i would call this one down all right so we do go for the call here get the reveal seven six unfortunately the turn was not very good for That's us sick. Yeah, but yeah. I think, you know, it's a good takeaway, though, too, of what you talked about is, like, as far as people that are going to be the big blind in general, I would say a lot of ranges. Some people just wouldn't three bet this at all. So it's, like, almost a weird thing where it's, like, he's going to have a wider range, so he's going to be able to maybe potentially find some more bluffs, but then he's also going to have a value hand, like a 7-6 in position where, or, sorry, in his position where a lot of others might not. So he has some more value hands there as well. Yeah, so it's, like, a secretly a good showdown for your call. And I think, yeah. like... Again, you have to always remember, like, 7-6, it's, it's just nothing. It's two combos, you just don't care about it. Yeah. Whereas, like, when he has 7-6, like you said, it's much more likely he has jack-6, which is, mm -hmm. like, three combos on its own. Uh, King-6, maybe, just as I to play this way. So, like, in general, like you said, very good showdown to see mm -hmm. um, for our call, even if it means we instantly lose 500 bucks. But yeah. this is the, <laughs> the way of the game. Yeah, exactly. Now, as far as from, like, Dom's perspective here, um, are we on the flop? Are you betting this type of hand here? So like if we, um, so go yeah, back definitely. to his, it, it, yeah. even if I played a different CBS strategy, I'd always bet seven six because um, like yeah, just good good properties blocks your nuts and like you'll probably fold a bit too much by the river like we just talked about because yep. of, uh, so like, it's like a bluff a secret bluff which you don't expect people to have. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think um, it will it will end well for him to start the flop by betting. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously the turn and river are pretty easy. He just turns it. Now I guess could he have yeah. like a check raise on the turn, or you just you just really mostly just want to be betting. You could always consider checking nuts and free pots, specifically when you unblock the ace, right? Because yeah. if you if you well, like unblock the top card is better. Example, like if it was like king nine deuce and you have pocket nines, it's quite nice to check because mm -hmm. the imposition player's going to keep betting like king queen king jack. Mm -hmm. um, but ace x in general, what I'm thinking is I'm like oh, I could I could check my seven six, but David. He's going to be a bit scared with ace and also he doesn't get any protection with like betting Finn, so he's just going to check it back. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking more like I want to keep shoveling with my good hands because um, he's going to check back a lot of hands, which would call my bets. Um, and then also like in position here, like you see, if you, can, if you check if he checks you here, what kind of hands do you want to bluff him with? Uh, yeah, as far as the bluffing ones, it's going to be tough. I feel like I would be betting some spades here probably um, instinctively. So if I had flatted, say like a jack ten suited, queen jack suited, ten nine suited. Um, particularly, yep. it's a little bit maybe different against Dom, but I think a lot in population, I don't get check jammed here almost ever in this spot. So I feel much more comfortable like betting my spades and not having to check back to realize. Cause like, obviously if we like bet like the, like say a 10 nines, we have like a gut shot with the back door sp or with the spades and we get jammed on it kind of stinks where we want to realize, but like versus population for the most part, I'd feel pretty comfortable that I can bet without getting raised very often. Exactly. Yeah. I think those hands are good, but the, the key thing is if we think about these spade hands alone, they're like. I mean, like each one is one combo, right? So like mm -hmm. ten nine, one combo, uh, like queen jack, one combo. Yeah. Um, so like, and then you have ace queen, ace king, which maybe is like uh, ten combos. Mm -hmm. So um, what I'm trying to say is that if you just rep, if you just bet draws on ace high, you, you're always under bluffing heavily, mm -hmm. um, which means that your opponent can just uh, like it's not appealing for him to trap if you aren't bluffing much. Uh, yeah. If that makes sense. So that's another reason I'm saying like uh, shoveling is better and. The bluffs which you kind of missed, I think, which which are worth finding, particularly against player pool, mm -hmm. are the low pocket pairs. Uh, so you've called the pocket, like pocket fours, pocket fives, etc. 
And when you have these hands, you block a6, uh, which is very good. And you unblock king, queen off, so you unblock pocket kings, pocket queens, pocket jacks, pocket tens, which are all going to be in like very tough scenarios if you bet mm -hmm. twice here. So yeah, at least considering bluffing like uh, low pocket pairs as well, I think it, it's, it's going to like be it's good in, good against a very good player and against weaker players becomes very very good. Um, now, are you, as far as like the fives, the fours, the world here, are we? What's the preference on having a spade or not having a spade? Like, so we're talking about basically to make sure everyone's up to date where we're at. We're talking about here if like Dama checked the turn. So like if he checks turn here, and we want to look at starting to blast off with some of our small pairs here. Does it make a difference if it's like fives or fours of the spade, or is the suit not super relevant? Uh, not super relevant because like uh, our sets. If we make a set, we don't really care if a flush completed or not. Anyway, you know. Yeah. Um, but probably a bit better to not have a spade, but only because you don't block ace x. Like mm -hmm. if you have uh, ace five of spades, you block less of the ace x that you free bets preflop maybe. Okay. Um, so yeah, not not super relevant, but yeah, I think the main thing is just just betting these pocket pairs is good, and um, weaker weaker players tend to miss them a bit. I think um, where like it like it's kind of a funny thing like the. The more you're perceived as a weaker player, uh, so like if, if you're perceived as like the worst nidiest reg in your pool, yeah. the better it is to find these combos because the more like respect you're gonna get for your um, yeah. for your bluff. So like uh, yeah, like the, the less like if you listen to this video and you're like oh, I might miss them, then the more you think that, the better it probably is for you to actually find them. Just um, because you'll get a lot more respect by the river if you're basically barreling yeah. turn and river. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. All right. Perfect. So unfortunately for us, tough turn card there, and Dom ships the all in pots. Yeah, but well played on. All right, guys, that's going to wrap up today's video. Thank you so much to George for joining us. I really enjoy having this high-level poker knowledge being shared with all of you and with myself. I already learned so much from the video today. Uh, so, George, thanks for being on and also for the audience if they're interested in following along on your journey or learning where, uh, finding out where they can learn more from you as well as BitV, where would be some contacts for that? Yeah, sure. Um, well, you can check out our Twitter uh, at BitVCash. Um, my personal Twitter, I believe, is at George underscore YMB. Uh, it'll be in the description anyway. Um, and we also post a bit on 2 plus 2. Um, and I think, yeah, for, for people watching this video, obviously it's like really exciting what's happening with American poker right now. Like uh, the, the market's getting bigger and bigger. It's like a very good opportunity to, to get involved. Um, and yeah, enjoyable hands too. And I think um, just trying to think of some good takeaways, uh, quite wide ranging, but generally just, yeah, in these big pots, it's very easy to be like more scared and it's more visual when you lose a stack and um, just being aware that like, still, you still get the same pot odds in general. Calling, losing is like a big part of poker. Um, bluffing and losing too, and like aggression tends to pay off. So yeah, try and try and like uh, put that last bet in and be be more happy about it. And yeah, we'll just wrap up as well by saying any Americans who are like looking to make the next step and uh, get to kind of high stakes, we have like a very good track record. A bit B, obviously, which you can see from our Twitter. And if you're interested more, obviously feel free to reach out in. Um, DM2, but hopefully everyone enjoyed uh, the video. All right, sounds good. Thank you so much, George. And we'll be back next video, guys, with some more Twitch highlights for you. Cheers, David.